W here with welcome to your characteristics of life video. The essential question for this video is how do we define life? Before we get started answering that question, first let's back the train up and talk about the definition of biology. Biology is the study of life. I'm going to teach you some root words really quick. When I talk about root words, what I'm talking about is greet prefixes and suffixes. And basically when we take these greet prefixes or suffixes and we memorize what those mean, we can kind of come up with a definition of a lot of words without the long drawn out definition that you would see in a textbook. So for example, biology is literally broken down into the root words bio and logi. Bio means life, logi means the study of. So when I put that together, I get the study of life. So if I can kind of remember some of these root words throughout this course, um, it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to figure out definitions of this pretty much whole new language that you're gonna learn in biology. So when we talk about biology, um, we can't just talk about life. It doesn't begin and end with that. There's a lot of non-living things in our environment that we require as living beings. So it's really a marriage between both living and non-living. We have to look at it all. Okay, so let me give you some more root words here. Bio, remember, means life or living. Now I'm going to give you a new one, which is A. And A, if it's like at the beginning of a word, can usually mean non. So here's two words that you guys need to know, biotic and abiotic. These are going to be the scientific words or the biology course words that we use to describe things that are living and things that are non-living. So let's practice really quick. Take a look at this picture. Um, bear, obviously living. So this would be considered biotic. Okay. Fish, biotic. Now the river or the water that's making up the river, while there are some living things in that water, the water itself is non-living. So it would be considered abiotic. Okay. This moss back here in the background is a type of plant. So it would be considered biotic. Okay. But the air, um, that you can't really necessarily see, but the air surrounding the bears and the fish and the stream and all of that is obviously non-living. So that would be considered abiotic. Now, just imagine in this ecosystem, it's completely made up of biotic and abiotic things. And so we can't, we can't just talk about a bio, um, biology. We can't just talk about life and um, be done with it. That's not the end of the story. We have to talk about both. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. Today, though, we're going to stick to our essential question, which is how do we define life? Okay, how do I tell the difference between something that is biotic and abiotic? What is the definition of life? And to answer that, well, it's actually really complicated. But what scientists have observed is that there are some characteristics that no matter what type of living organism you are, you're going to follow these characteristics. Okay. And there's eight of them. So here they are. I'll just put them up on the screen for you guys to look at. Um, basically, what scientists have discovered, no matter if they're looking at a single celled organism or a multi cell organism like yourself, or if they're looking at bacteria or um, plants, it doesn't matter. All living organisms follow these eight characteristics. OK, they are cellular. They have a genetic code. They grow and develop. They reproduce. They respond to stimuli. They require energy and they maintain homeostasis and they can adapt and evolve. So quick little helpful hint for you guys. If you check out page 17 of your textbook, it's going to go over all of these characteristics of life in detail. But I'm also going to do it in this video. So what about viruses? Real quick, I do want to touch on that because I get this question a lot and we actually will talk about it during semester two of this course. But what about viruses? Are they considered alive? And the, the short answer is no. They do not follow all of the characteristics of life. They cannot reproduce on their own. They don't respond to stimuli. They aren't made of cells. They don't require energy, etc. And so we cannot consider them living according to our current definition of life or the current characteristics of life. So that's where we are right now with viruses, just so you know, and we'll talk more about that next semester. Okay. I love this visual. This is one of those visuals that I'm actually going to have for you guys on my website and you need to go grab it and print it out and hang it up in your study space, because this is something that we're going to also refer to all year long. Okay. Um, 
This is the level of organization in the living world. Okay, it's also called the hierarchy of life. So I'm going to start um, on this graphic and kind of explain it. All things, all matter is made up of atoms. Okay, so oh, chemistry, right? I know you're all going back to eighth grade science and going, no, please don't talk about chemistry. Well, I love chemistry and you're going to be learning it again next year. And we're going to talk about it a lot in this course too, because all living things are made of atoms. And so we have to, we're living things. Um, we're made of atoms. So we have to talk about it, but are atoms themselves alive? And the answer is no. Okay. Um, if I were to just hand you a hydrogen atom, it's not alive on its own. Okay. It's just not, but we're going to put those atoms together. And we're going to make a molecule. Our molecule is alive. No, this is actually a picture of a water molecule and we know that water is not alive, but it is made of molecules. Okay. And we're going to be talking about a term this year called biomolecules. Biomolecules are molecules necessary for life or the building blocks of life, but the molecules themselves are not alive. Okay. So keep that in mind, not alive yet. Then we have organelles. Another term you're going to be learning about this year. Organelles are like these little sub compartments within a cell, a eukaryotic cell, and they have certain functions. Um, they're kind of like the organs of the cell, but guess what? Organelles by themselves, not alive. It's not until we put those organelles together um, in a eukaryotic cell and prokaryotic cells don't have organelles, but we have some other really important cellular components that will come together and we get a cell. Okay. When we get to this level, this is where life begins. Everything below this is abiotic. Okay, so this is where life begins, is at the cellular level. Now, in multicellular organisms, when cells get put together and all of those cells have a similar function, they make up a tissue. Okay, when we have certain tissues that are all together and they have a certain function, that's when we get an organ. When we have certain organs that all work together, like your digestive system, okay, that's called an organ system, okay? And then when we take those organ systems and we all put them together for a functioning individual, that's called an organism, okay? Organisms of the same species in an area are going to be called a population, okay? And then we get to a biological community, which is all the living organisms in that area together. And then we get to an ecosystem, which is going to come back in and include all the living organisms in that area, but also all the abiotic factors in that area as well and how they all interact together. Okay. And then we get a biome, which is going to be something like the Sahara desert, which is there's similar um, climate throughout that entire area. There may be some sub ecosystems within that area, but that because of that similar climate, we're going to see similar types of organisms. So that's a biome. And then we look at a biosphere, which is basically all the area on earth that supports life. That's a biosphere. Okay. So here's that hierarchy of life. Again, make sure you know and love this hierarchy of life. And please make sure that you note that life does not begin until you get to the cell level. All right. So let's talk about cellular. That's our first characteristic of life. I kind of already talked about this. All living things are made of cells, every single one of them. They're the basic unit of life. We'll talk more about cells and cell structure later um, and what those common structures that all cells have. But there's two basic types, and we'll talk way more about this later, but I love introducing these terms early. Prokaryote, which means it does not have a nucleus, and a eukaryote, which means that it does have a nucleus. So what's a nucleus? Well, a nucleus is a compartment. It's an organelle within eukaryotic cells only, and that's where we would find the genetic material or the DNA. Okay, which leads me right into our next characteristic of life, which is the genetic code. All living organisms have a genetic code. I was just talking about the difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Eukaryotes definitely have that genetic code in the nucleus. Prokaryotes also have that genetic code, but it's floating out in the cytoplasm. There's no nucleus surrounding it. It still has a genetic code though. And so all living organisms have this and it's called DNA deoxyribonucleic acid. You guys are going to learn so much about DNA this year that you're just going to love it so much. We're going to have a whole unit just on DNA and all of its functions and how it's replicated and how, how it gets from passed on from one generation to the next and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, it's, it's, it's huge. It contains all the information that makes you, you or any organism, any organism. So it's, 
It is the building blocks in order to grow and develop all the structures that you have, all the different functions that your cells have to perform or that you perform. All of that is coded in these like little instruction manuals called DNA. And so we'll talk about how that works later on this year, but just know that all living things contain DNA. Um, grow and develop. All organisms grow and develop. Um, it's specific to the type of organism. For example, you can see I have like um, a human on here. We start as babies and we grow into children and then we get older into adulthood and then later we progress um, into elderly kind of fashion where things start to go downhill. Um, but you guys get the idea. There's like an order, it's specific. There's usually a pattern for those organisms, okay? But we were able to grow and develop. Reproduce. All living organisms reproduce, which means that they produce a new similar organism. There's two types of reproduction, asexual reproduction, and this is where a single cell is just going to produce and make an identical copy of itself, and that's going to be its offspring, and it's identical, and that's called asexual reproduction. And then sexual reproduction is where, where we have two cells from two different parents, or one cell from two different parents, and they unite to form the first cell of the new organism. For example, my cute little elephant family here okay um, a cell from mom and a cell from dad met and fused together and that was the start of little um, baby elephant here okay this picture is actually showing an amoeba going through asexual reproduction so it starts as one cell it grows um, it and then it eventually starts to split so it grows I think it's going this way it's growing growing, growing, and then it eventually is going to split into two cells. So that's an example of asexual reproduction. All right, next one is respond to stimuli, and you guys have all experienced this. All living organisms are able to detect and respond to their environment. Um, so have you ever gotten goosebumps, right, and your hair stands up on your arms or your legs or whatever? Okay, well, this is all about creating this kind of fluffy, warm layer around your body to help keep you warm, okay? That's you re responding to the temperature in your external environment. Um, so stimulus is a signal to which an organism responds to. So just kind of know that you are able to respond to stimuli. Um, another great example of this is when you walk outside and the light is really bright and you squint, okay, that's your eyes adjusting um, and you kind of responding to that stimuli so that you don't look directly into the sun, okay? All right, six, requires energy. All living things obtain and use material for energy. There's two major types, autotrophs, heterotrophs. Autotrophs are able to make their own food using energy from either sunlight or chemicals. Um, if they get it from sunlight, they're called phototrophs. If they get it from chemicals, they're called chemiotrophs. So we'll talk about both of those this year. And then we have heterotrophs, which is like you and me, where we have to eat other organisms for food. Okay, so what's the whole point? What's this food all about? Well, food is what we use as energy to perform metabolism. Okay, metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions in your body. This is where we build things up, break things down, whatever it needs in order to grow, develop, respond to stimuli, all the different things in your body um, go through chemical reactions in order to be you. Okay, so that's metabolism. Um, little side note, energy is the ability to do work. So Anything that you're doing, moving, talking, thinking, that all requires energy. Um, it can never be created or destroyed energy, so we have to transfer it from one form to another. And we're going to talk about two very important processes that energy gets transferred from one form to another this year, and that's photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So watch Watch my videos over that later this year when we're going over this and you'll kind of understand what I'm talking about. But I did put a really big word on here, ATP. I wanted to throw that out there to you now. This is the molecule that your cells use as energy. And so that's, we're gonna talk about photosynthesis and cellular respiration and how they relate into making that ATP. All right, seventh characteristic of life is maintaining homeostasis. So all organisms are able to maintain a stable internal environment. Um, another root word for you guys, homeo means same, okay? So same and then stasis means state. So literally this means same state. Homeostasis is that ability for organisms to maintain that constant internal environment or stable environment despite the 
crazy changes that are going out on in the external environment. A great example of this is shivering when you're cold. That's your body uh, maintaining, working to maintain a constant internal temperature and then sweating when you're hot. That's another way that your body is maintaining that constant internal temperature. So that's homeostasis, okay? And we'll talk about how that works specifically um, next semester. We will this semester be talking about the cell membrane and the cell, cell membrane's job is to maintain homeostasis for the cell. And so we're gonna talk about how the cell membrane does that in a future video and lessons throughout the year. All right, last one, number eight, is evolve and adapt, okay? So when we talk about evolve and adapt, we're not talking about the individual organism anymore. We're talking about the group as a whole, okay? The group of, as a whole is able to evolve. So what does that mean? Basically, that means that over generations, groups will change maybe their appearances or the way that they perform certain functions based on adaptations that are best suited for the environment. Um, the way that I like to say this is the organisms that have the best traits, are this, they're going to survive because they, they are the most fit. And if they survive, that means that they're going to be passing on those traits to future generations. And this will make a lot more sense once we talk about um, DNA and some of the other topics that we talk about um, before we get to the evolution unit. But basically, I like to tell a quick little story about this with the drafts. Okay, take a look at this picture. Um, when we look back in the fossil record, we can see that organisms that are very closely related to our today drafts had really short necks. And so how did that happen? How did one organism's neck grow? And the answer is no. Most likely there was a variation within the group where we had drafts that had short necks and we had drafts that had long necks within the population. But the drafts with the long necks were able to survive and reproduce more than the ones with the short necks because they could reach their food source. Okay, so they, they were the um, most fit, so they're gonna survive longer, reproduce more, and their future, their offspring are gonna also have those long necks. So over time, we kind of see this shift from drafts with short necks to populations with long necks over, and it's, it was gradual change, but eventually we have what we have today as drafts. So that's kind of how evolution works in a very short, like little time span um, explanation. But what happens if organisms can't evolve, and this is where extinction occurs. And sometimes this happens because of us. We change the environment so rapidly that organisms um, don't have time or there's not adaptations within that, within that population that can survive the changes that we've caused. And some of it has happened naturally throughout time like the dodo bird. So there's a quick explanation of evolving and adapting. And this brings us to the wrap up of this video our characteristics of life again, let me get them up here, is cellular genetic code, grow and develop, reproduce, respond to stimuli, require energy, maintain homeostasis, and they can adapt and evolve. So that's it. Thanks for watching and I hope this helped.